I, you know, okay, I think the whole theme of today's show is going to be about love. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Marshall Ramsey. I am editor at large at Mississippi Today. I'm also the editorial cartoonist as well. And I am your host today for an incredibly special Mississippi stories. And you can see the two reasons right there to my other side why it's special. But it's also special because we are doing this live and we have a lot of members in the audience too. And I want to give a quick shout out to all the members and say thank you so much, A, for your support of Mississippi Today, but for joining us today and for providing some really amazing questions. In fact, I've got five of them right here that I will ask toward the end of this session. But um, I guess without further ado, we got to introduce our guests. And I kind of feel silly for even having to introduce you because I feel like that everybody that's on today knows who you are because uh, you guys have just blown up to be incredibly huge stars, but you're still the same down to earth, great people you were back even when you first started this whole crazy TV adventure. But I'm going to read the official bios. Ben Napier is a woodworker and entrepreneur with a degree in history, which I absolutely love that. He's founder of Scotsman Company and co-owner of Laurel Mercantile Company. He's a past president of the Laurel Main Street America chapter dedicated to promoting the rebirth of their downtown district and uh, after my own heart because he's as good at dad jokes as I am. And I absolutely love that about you. I, I, I'll sit there and just cackle at some of the things you say on your episodes. And Aaron it's Napier, so what's that? There is so much that just quality dad content that gets cut. It's oh, you got to be kidding! You got to do like a, a you know a special episode. They really should do like a, a super cut, a super cut of dad jokes. Yeah, you know, I mean, you did the Christmas special, so why not doing a dad joke special? I think for Father's Day it would be a great episode. Oh gosh, it'd be great! Yeah, there you Maybe go. I'm pitch that. I'm gonna pitch that <laughs> idea. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Let me get my pen. I'll write that down and I'll send that to Aaron right there too, is just an incredible artist. Aaron, I am like, I am envious of your artwork. It's just beautiful, but you're also a designer and entrepreneur with a fine arts degree. You started your career in corporate graphic design before founding her, your own international stationary company, Lucky Lux. And you're a founding member also of the Laurel Mercantile Company. Also, you're on this little show called Hometown, which I love the origin story of that show because, I mean, and I, Amy is not in the room with me right now, so I can say this, but she'll find out later. Y'all basically did a home renovation and you were putting it up on Instagram and it got, you got discovered that way. And then long story short, you got a call from HGTV. If Amy and I did a home renovation together, it would probably be Dr. Phil that called us after I put it up on Instagram because it was. Because I don't know. I, the, uh, the true test of a marriage is painting a room together. Amen. Wallpaper taking down wallpaper, too. Ooh, that's a rough one. Yeah. Yeah. I think we got divorced six times in a day on that <laughs> one. But <laughs> that's why I always hate The Bachelor because I feel like if they made them take down wallpaper together, that would be a better true test of what a marriage could be. Oh, where the, yeah. Where you the see rubber really meets really the road. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, okay, I think the whole theme of today's show is going to be about love, right? I mean, A, the love you two obviously have, and I love your origin story, and I'm going to get you to tell that because I feel like everybody needs to hear it. But also, too, the fact that you love your community and you love small towns around America. And, you know, we talk about brain drain a lot here in Mississippi, and I feel like that, and I've got a quote from you, Ben, that I'm going to trot out here in a minute, but I think that y'all have absolutely nailed the, the cure for brain drain is give kids a reason to want to come back home. And um, I just want to say thank you. Cause I mean, think what you've done for Mississippi and a, what you've done for Laurel has been nothing short of amazing. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's crazy how much has happened with this show. It's insane. Like, cause last night we had dinner with some of the folks from Viking uh, Mississippi company. And one of them asked us how the show happened. And, and it was, yeah. we haven't been asked that in a long time, but it's just insane how much has happened in the last seven years. Yeah, it is. And also it's very exciting to us to see people our age and younger who are telling us, you know, I thought I'd never come home to yeah. Mississippi, but you've made me think about it in a new way. And, and I think I want to go back home. That's like, if we do nothing else, I think that is the best yeah. thing 
to come out of hometown is to make people return to their small towns and make a difference there. Because when Aaron finished at Ole Miss and we moved back to Laurel to, you know, take a job at a corporate company, you know, where she was doing graphic design, it was considered like almost like she was settling or like she was going in reverse because she had this, you know, Bachelor of Fine Arts and everybody else that she graduated with was either going on to pursue a master's degree or they were moving to Nashville or New York and you know, they had these these big jobs and And then I thought, but you're all gonna go live in like a five hundred square foot apartment with a roommate and we are gonna go buy a two thousand square foot loft in downtown that we'll renovate ourselves. It'll feel like we live in Manhattan. We'll feel like you know, like you make you can make the best of where you are rather than just complain about its problems. Yeah. I think that that takes maturity that I didn't have when I was a teenager for sure, because I couldn't wait to leave Laurel when I was a teenager. But maybe the, and this is something that we talk about a lot. Aaron and I got to spend a weekend um, in this beautiful, it was a Jersey shore town, but not like, like not like Jersey not shore like the show. The show. Like it was these beautiful shingle style houses and just, you know, amazing views. And we were there with all these people. We were, the house was like a, it was a gigantic house and it was a friend of a friend's house. And we were there with all these people and we didn't know them. We knew two of the couples that were there um, and the rest of the people, we had no idea who they were. And we got to know them over the weekend and they sounded exact. These are people that were born and raised in New York and they sounded exactly like people who were born and raised in South Mississippi, they were like, oh, I, you know, I wanted to leave, but, you know, I just, was where I was born, was where I was born and, and, where my parents lived. and, you know, so I ended up, you know, I, I guess I kind of settled and stayed here and, you know, and it's like, there are things you can complain about mm -hmm. anywhere, everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> but why do you have to, because we love, Aaron and I love New York City. It yeah. feels like we have gone to another planet and, um, <laughs> And but you know these are people that were born and raised there, still live there, have never left, and they absolutely hated it. Yeah. So I we've decided that everywhere's got its problems, except maybe like those really great like Santorini, Greece looks pretty great. I don't I don't know. They look like they've fully revitalized, but um, everywhere you go has problems. So rather than complain about it, why not use your skills, whatever they are, to improve the situation? And that's kind of the birth of all this yeah yeah and it's it's you know i've always heard that you know basically you just kind of fix the world right around you and then you take it out a little bit further and a little bit further you know like you said i don't think that when the show debuted in 2016 i mean you had like two million viewers which was amazing for a debut episode but i think you had a snowstorm too that happened at the same time so so providence was smiling on you that day but I don't think you would have ever anticipated six years ago that you'd be sitting here right now with all the opportunities you've had, but y'all built small and you, and you built outward and you lifted up everybody else in the process. And I, and I was just sitting there trying to think about the, the real meaning of the, probably the meaning of your success. But I think the fact that you've helped so many other people along the way has really been a key to it. That's we had this conversation last night that we, um, so the, the birth of Laurel Mercantile Company was, it started, it was uh, Aaron and Ben Co. We had this little um, website, a little website yeah. that was like a, a side project to Lucky Lux. And I had some of my furniture on there and we had things that, you know, that Aaron vintage made. Vintage pieces I had And then we had vintage pieces that we were selling. And, um, but we knew we wouldn't be able to do that and make the show. And so um, the six owners, Jim and Mallory, who are on the show, Josh, who was on the show, and his wife, Emily, and then us, we... Our uh, best friends and college roommates, we all yeah. came together, started the company, because the more important thing is, if we're going to talk about really revitalizing small town America, you have to think about job creation and also yeah. manufacturing. Right. So that was, it had to be critical and important for us. If we're going to do this, a holistic approach to improving Laurel would be opening business in places that have not had business in a very long time. Front street was dead. There was one store that was open. Yeah. Lot furniture is the oldest store in the world and they're still open and they're doing better than ever. But now we, we anchored ourselves on the worst end of front street. 
so that we could hopefully draw foot traffic that direction and fill it in as we go with more businesses who want to move there. And we've just been piecemealing this plan together from experience and travel and figuring out what makes a small town come back to life. And, and it's, um, and that's one thing that like on the show on hometown takeover that we wanted to dive more into and, um, is that yes, beautiful houses make a town look better. You know, sure, fixing the streets, getting a government grant to redo sidewalks, yes, that makes it look better. And that helps a ton. But if you don't have jobs, then you don't have people. And if you don't have people, then you don't have a town. Um, they don't call a ghost town a ghost town because it, you know, the way it looks. Yeah. It's that there is, there's nobody there. It's the ghost of the people that used to live there. And so um, when we started the mercantile, we knew that, you know, we didn't want to have everything. You know, we didn't want to have a men's clothing store and a bakery and a home design store. We want to encourage other people to do that. Yeah. And so we wanted to, and that's, you know, part of the thing was we wanted to have our store anchored over here. But you know what? This really great bakery is on the total opposite side of downtown. But you can walk there and it's only, you know, two and a half blocks. And, um, then, you know, now, and we always knew that we eventually wanted to get into manufacturing. We wanted to, to make our own things and because then that provides even more jobs. And then we also want to eat just the, the trickle of the, the ripple effect of our store was something that we were very aware of and what we wanted it to do. And so that's why we focused on American made goods. And mm -hmm. you know, then you, Marshall hasn't gotten asked the question. I know, yet. I know, but <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I mean, that's that's the beauty of this. We have a lot to say about American made and small town business, but um, yeah. job creation. Job that's creation. The, that's the the big thing for what we were trying to do with our company. Now with the show, we weren't trying to do anything, and it just happened. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it, you know, I mean, I do enough television that. Number one, I know it's harder than it looks. Um, now, for instance, last year, um, I mean, there was a show called Handcrafted Hotels. It's on Discovery Plus, right? So they're featuring the graduate hotels. And I did the artwork for the Knoxville Graduate Hotel. And so uh, anyway, they came in for a two and a half minute segment. They filmed for 12 hours. They, they filmed a, about a three hour segment of my dog walking up and down the street. She finally protested, sat down and went on strike. On that, but mm -hmm. it, it's, I mean, it's a long day when you're filming and everything else, but the television can hide some things, but if you're not like really good people for the most part, it'll come through eventually. Y'all just come across really like, cause that was the thing when I told people I was going to interview you today, everybody's like, I love them. They are Aww. so nice. I've been to Laurel. They're amazing. And it was just like, you even have five star rated books on Amazon. Nobody does that. You know, I mean, it's like. Y'all, y'all really have managed to come across well. When you did that first show, y'all had never done television before, had you? No. Nope. Wow. No. Nope. Okay. There was uh, doing TV either. Yeah. So the first episode, because we didn't, they didn't know what the format of our show would be. Yeah. And one of the things they wanted to do with our show was change our format constantly, um, which is exhausting for us. Yeah. But uh we filmed like a hundred hours of tv for one 45 minute show to figure and out the blue it was seriously it was 100 yeah. hours what yeah. hometown would be yeah and there was so much that they didn't use like entire storylines that just wow disappeared. and um anyway but yeah that's no, making tv is and I think it's that, so much fun. It's really, yeah, so it much really it's, yeah. it is a lot of work. Um, but and, yeah, I mean, I got a brother that's a truck driver and that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that, that brings us to our first question. I'll just go and have, how long does it actually take to complete a project? This is from Cornelian, Georgia. Uh, from demo to reveal, and what is the time frame basically? Because I mean, you obviously are in a forty-five minute episode, but how long does it take from beginning to end to to redo a house? 
on average seven weeks we do and we do five houses in seven weeks um they're going at the same time okay that's not always the case so like you know we we like to say on average because I currently we're dealing with two houses that we almost tore down yeah we almost tore down once the first time like we've ever oh wow we, we got two at once. two we have two of them gosh I forgot about two I'm thinking about the Sims house we've got three houses currently <laughs> that one of them we discovered something that was so bad that I the house would have become unstable after we finished it it was something that we weren't going to do yeah. and then we discovered it and it was like we have to fix this or your house is going to cave in and then the other one it was the other two one was hit by a tornado and one was just a ten thousand dollar you get what you get house yeah and it was that one was so bad and it's a it's really awesome but don't young, tell too much i know, I know it's it. this really awesome guy um <laughs> and it came down to like we met with him over the budget and it's the first time we've ever done this where we we presented him with an option where we tear down this house and we build you a new one on the same footprint. And uh, anyway, it was, so that one didn't happen. But anyway, those three houses have gone over time. And they're going to take a couple months. Yeah. 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 Right. I was going to ask you if you ever get in and find termite damage or, you know, find stuff like that, because I mean, I was like, so watch an episode and most of the houses are like said, they may need some TLC, but structurally the bones are good on the house. And, yeah. and, I, and I don't know about Laurel up here. We have Yazoo clay, which is like, you know, the devil for foundations and things like that. But so I was just going to ask, and I, you pretty much answered it on that for the most part though, most of the houses are in pretty good shape, aren't they? They're pretty good shape. We've um, oddly the, the newer houses, it's not that they weren't better built. It's that yeah. the materials aren't as good. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Formosan termites. They yes. came into the port in, I think, in New Orleans. And then they have spread north from there. And we have been seeing more and more of them. Uh, we currently have a tree on our farm that's a beautiful tree. And it's part of the reason we love the house. And we just got it pruned. And they're like, Oh yeah, you got for most and termites in your oh. tree. It's gonna have to come down. So yeah, um, there when we work on houses like Jesse's, house, my brother and his wife on the show, um, we did their house and the front part of their house was built in like the 1920s, but at some point it was added onto in the rear, and um, we uncovered they had for for most and termites in the back of the house and. Um, so anyway, for the most part, yeah, the houses are great. Um, we do run into problems here and there, but we're, we're so good. Like our, our team is so good. We have yeah. our people, our contractors are so good. And our team is really good at stacking contractors. So we may have, you know, framers working underneath the house uh, while electricians are running electrical in the kitchen. And the plumbers are plumbing the bathroom. And... It takes master scheduling. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to bring that up because I think that honestly, if y'all have a superpower, it's got to be scheduling because with all Not the us. projects you've got going and two small, beautiful girls. And I mean, y y you probably schedule from the moment that you wake up every day to the time you hit the sack. And I would imagine if you didn't do that, everything would probably fly off into space. So before we... Got on. We were talking about how I'm I'm up I'm on Twitter at four thirty yeah, in the morning. Right. Um. So from basically from four thirty or five in the morning till we lay Helen down at eight o'clock, our day is scheduled and planned. Yeah. And uh, and we're also like we are looking at our summer plans for. 23 right now like we're to look that's how far wow. out yeah and um and it's the hardest part of that is like i've got i've got three brothers there's four of us aaron's family all lives right here so you know uh get together on sunday afternoon not a big deal i've got a brother that lives on the coast i've got one that lives here and i've got one that lives above tupelo outside of baldwin and i've got my parents live in baldwin and so for us to get together, it has, you have so many schedules and so many things and we're really close, my brothers and I. And so like 
cruising the coast is a big one for us. It is like a hard line on the schedule. Yeah. Do not plan anything for the first week of October. I'm not going to be filming. Like we're not going anywhere because I'm going to be on the coast with my brothers. Um, but it's, that's the hardest part of the scheduling, I think is, yeah. you know, make time for, cause if I have free time, I want like I'll get people who'll say, you know, hey, you ought to go you want to go fishing with me this weekend or you want to come over to the house and look yeah. at this project I'm working on. Like if I got free time, I've got three beautiful blonde girls that I want to hang out with and there's three other guys that look like me that I want to hang out with. So um that's the hardest thing is getting people to understand like I realize you're busy. I'm I I know how busy I will be one year from now. I know what that day looks like. Wow. Wow. I, I'm not really sure what I'm doing tomorrow. So I'm pretty impressed by that. On that, We don't make that schedule though. <laughs> what What's yeah, that? Yeah. Not a, like we have. Um, Our producers make that We have schedule. producers. Okay. We have a, it's like we have, we have people that make the, make the schedule. They tell us where us. we're going. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to ask you about that. Cause I, you know, I know from the, MPB television show I did conversations that you know if I didn't have a really great producer and a good team that I worked with on it I couldn't have done it you know I mean I, I you know I just showed up and I had done the research and did the interview but everything else fell together y'all have an incredibly gifted team that works with you uh, Laura who I've been working with with your scheduling is incredible um, you do have just but like you said if you're going to be actually be able to do all the things you got to do you, you got to have that help yeah, yeah. It's, um, mentioned- it's incredible. Yeah. You mentioned cruising on the coast. Do y'all have a car, a special car that you bring down there? Well, Marshall. Uh Oh, did I bring up a problem? Oh, he's turning red. Well, That's not good. I don't, are- I don't know how many cars we have. Oh, really? So, I don't know. so when Aaron and I started I seen- dating, Aaron's a car girl also now she's okay. into that. Not at the level that I am, but I <laughs> I told Aaron when we started dating, I said, look, I don't drink. I've never, never had alcohol. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, smoke. I don't do drugs. I don't chase women. I don't golf. I don't uh, hunt. hunt. I have zero hobbies basically, um, except for cars. And I said, you know, and I don't have expensive taste in cars. None of them are worth much at all, but we got a lot of them. <laughs> I, got a, I, I bought my dream car last year and it's a 70 Chevelle. Nice. And, um, but also we have a, a 99 Suburban that looks just like Tony Soprano's that is maybe my most prized <laughs> possession. Um, we have a 87 Blazer that looks like Hoppers on Stranger, Stranger Things. Things. That's nice. the best money I've ever spent on a vehicle. It's like a $5,000 truck. It's a good one. And I, I drive it all the time. I love it. Um, and then there's my pickup from the show. Anyway, there's like, we, we have like 15 vehicles. Yes, he takes them to cruise in the car. So do you have like an Elvis style garage somewhere where you just have them all parked in there? Or? No, we sure don't. That's the <laughs> okay. We, we have loving parents who let yeah. us park our crap at their houses. <laughs> oh, we're working it out. Yeah, we're, we're, we're currently trying to build it's really expensive to build things right now even, i've noticed even, that yes even for us yeah like you know I'm, we know all the people and all the connections and it still just costs like a i'm lot like to build yeah something. trying to pull strings and like you know, hey what kind of deal can you do me on okay well we'll wait till next year then we'll let me, let me push that out a little bit so well that's i mean that's a really good segue and i guess into my next question was how the pandemic has affected the show and in in a lot of ways it was great because everybody was trying to fix something and i'm sure that everybody was sitting at home watching your show so that's a win but you know i mean i literally put on a screened in porch that went up three thousand dollars in costs trying to put on the screen within a month i mean it was just nuts and you couldn't get half the the stuff because of supply chain issues absolutely Um, yeah when we we were the first uh, HGTV show to go back to work. Okay. And, um, we our we went um, back to work in July 2020. Yeah, July 2020. We took uh, we were off April, May, and June, and half of March. 
And when we went back, or we were off. We were supposed much all to have July. started back at the beginning of May. So yeah. it got to the end of July. Anyway, there were horrible supply chain The smears. supply chain issues, but then also what you were just saying, like we priced out houses to the homeowners. And yeah. then, you know, two months later, we were getting ready to start on them because we were trying to, our team was trying to stay ahead and like, okay, let's get as much prep done as we can. And then we had to go back to the homeowners and be like, we're sorry. so sorry, but. Yeah. You know, it, it, two by fours have quadrupled in price. Yeah. Um, it is it is insane what that has done. And we are we're making it work on the show. We are worried that like you probably you've probably seen the last hundred thousand dollar hometown house. Yeah. Like those are. And that's not because of tourism and people moving to Laurel and all that. The housing market and the cost of building now is such that it's just not possible. And those are, well, no, actually the house that we took that we almost tore down, it's like, it's going to end up being like 110, I think. Something like that. Um, but. The weirdest thing that the pandemic brought with them, you know, the entire filming industry for the whole world follows the set of standards that are non-negotiable it's uh, yeah we don't know who sets them or anyway but we have to follow them and we basically live in a bubble so yeah. every person we come in contact with is tested two or three times a week and us included yeah. everyone we work with is wearing a mask still i mean it's it's incredibly stringent because we have to be healthy because if we're not healthy no one works the entire right. country is shut down and that's a huge inconvenience for everybody. So we have to stay healthy at all costs. And it's been strange the way. And also, I mean, like we're not, we're, we have, we love our crew, our camera crew and all yeah. those guys. We don't ever want to inconvenience them. And like the construction crew, they're like, you know, they're, they have jobs lined up. So like if they can't come work on a hometown house today, they're, all right. they're fine. They'll go work at one of their others. But our camera crew, they're on contract with our show and they can't just go and work somewhere. So if they're, if they're not working, they're not getting paid. And um, so we're, Aaron and I've been really careful, but uh, the weirdest thing is, so like a lot of companies, um, we got really scared at the beginning of the pandemic and we were looking at our finances and we we're like, okay, this is fixing to get really bad we need to lay off some of our, we had like a lot of college hourly employees. Mm -hmm. And um, then we had a lot of like people who, you know, had families, people with families and they were dependent on our, their income from us to put food on the table. And so we kept all of them and we were like, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to lay everybody out. And this is, we're laying off our hourly college kids. I'm, I'm a little mm -hmm. bit bitter about this because <laughs> in the meeting where we decided on this our business partners they're like ben you're gonna make the phone calls because you're like the santa claus of the group okay when you call and give them that bad news it's gonna land a little softer from yeah. you and and then i was like i said you know no problem i'll do it and mm -hmm. then the next thing was but don't worry when it's time to hire them all back you're making the call you get to bring the good news too. I was like, awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. It was one week of quarantine. So we, we laid everybody off on Friday. Yeah. The following Tuesday, I came to the wood shop and I saw one of the hourly people that I had laid off. And I was like, Hey, what's up? What are you doing? You know, I thought they had just come by to hang yeah, out. Like 10 days out of their later. Goodwill. Not three yeah. days later. Yeah. It was like 10 days later. And they were like, Oh, uh, Jim called me and said I could come back to work. They all well, got rehired because everybody, everybody got oh, no. everybody got rehired. I didn't get to tell any of them, and but it was because everybody went home and yeah. got locked down, and they were watching HGTV, and they started ordering from our company, and so we closed our brick and mortar store and basically just turned it into a distribution center, and yeah. we started shipping, shipping, and so we hired all those people back and moved them from you know retail to shipping and handling. And but I still I didn't get to call them. I lowered, oh. I dropped the boom on them, and then someone else picked them up. Yeah. 
so you got to be the bad guy, but you didn't get to be the good guy. You get to be Santa Claus. That's no fun. I didn't get to bring the good news. Which, by the way, just if folks have not seen your Christmas special, you make a fine Santa Claus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, The the beard's the wrong color, but everything else is perfect. It's it's turning. It's starting to. He's got a few little white whiskers. They're coming in. that, that's called parenthood. You know, that's yeah. if I grew mine out, I would look like, like David Letterman right now. So it would be nice and white and, <laughs> and um, fluffy and kind of scary. Um, I tell you what, I'm, I, we're about halfway through and I'm going to share the screen. I want to show you all this drawing. Speaking of, since I got to look at you for a, and, and Aaron, I want to apologize. I got an older picture. So your hair's parted different in the picture, how I drew you. So let's see here. We're going to. Is this the cartoon? Yeah, hopefully. We haven't seen this, y'all. No, you haven't seen it. So this is this is new, and we're going to play the show so you can see it from the start. Oh, what? There you go. And if you'll notice, um, the trees and everything, it talks. It's just all written words on the things that you do for your community and you do for Mississippi. So. Oh, thank you so much, Marshall. You're That's very awesome. welcome. Construction stuff. Do you, yeah. do you draw digitally? I'm so curious about. Yeah, that like, you know, I started about three years ago using Procreate on the iPad yeah. and I still do pen and ink drawings like the stuff I did for the hotel was pen and ink and and um, which that's what brought me to the dance all the years ago with the editorial cartooning. But I do digitally and it's fun. Like for, and this is the second drawing which I sent you. I did a coloring sheet kind of in your honor that I when the pandemic started, I started doing coloring sheets that kids were stuck at home so they could color for free. And uh, so I used some of my children's book characters and I just want to say the alligator um, likes the demo as well. And he doesn't do a gentle demo. He does just basically (laughs) takes everything out. So. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. You are very welcome. We'll go back to that one. And I tell you what, I will, I will get you a copy of that one uh, for y'all to have. So. Okay. All right. That would be awesome. Yeah. So anyway, um, thank you. You didn't hit, un- you didn't turn it off as soon as I showed you. So that's good news. I was a little worried that you're going to look at it and go, that's awful. Click. <laughs> End of interview on that. All right. Well, let's, I mean, like you said, y'all have now got two amazing daughters, three and one. Um, I'm not quite one. I'm sorry to say, Yeah. Good grief. I know it's, it's, well, this year has seemed like about a year in the last three months, but tell it what's, what's life like. I mean, one of the things when I wanted to do this, um, I wanted to do it at noon and you know, Laura came back and said, no, they schedule family time every day. So it sounds like when you do that incredible schedule that you do, you have blocks of time so that your kids don't play cats in the cradle on you for the rest of your life, you know, I mean, it's, it's it's like y'all have made that a priority, haven't you, to make sure that your girls, you know, have mom and dad around, not off chasing. At lunch, we try to get home and eat with them. So we, we head out for work at eight in the morning, we come home at five. So it's just like a normal job, except we do try to eat lunch with them. And which for anybody, I don't know if anybody watching this is in the TV and film industry, but Eight to five is, um, we're yawning. Um, eight to five is very rare yeah. in this industry. Um, but that's, it's just something. Our crew likes it too, though. Yeah, our crew yeah, likes it. I bet. Um, and we used to have an hour lunch, and then they shortened that a little bit. So now our lunch is a little bit shorter, but we still pretty much get an hour lunch. Oh, that's um, cool. Uh, so, it's uh yeah it's important to us it's one of the things that we say no to a lot in in the interest of being with the girls yeah yeah it's easy to say no when you say yes to them yeah and we before may was born and you know before the pandemic we traveled a lot for speaking engagements and different things and uh kind of our our rule was if it was two nights you know, we fly in them and then spend the night and then we're, we work that day and then we spend the night and then we fly home. Then, you know, we would come. But if it was going to be more than two nights, if there was no way you could get the schedule, like if we were if we were not putting Helen to bed for three nights in a row, then we said 
no, we're not doing that. Or she's coming and so is a grandmother or a nanny or somebody. And so. you have to pay for it. Like we're not, we're not dipping into our pockets to make sure that, you know, we, if you want us to come bad enough, we'll do it. But she's coming with us. And uh, of course now with COVID, that's pretty much dried up. Yeah, um, we don't have to travel anymore, which is fine because I'm a homebody and I never want to leave. <laughs> I'm happy to be right here. And Helen is, it's funny, Helen has been everywhere. Like in the United States, she's traveled a lot. Everywhere we went, she went. And, and now May. May hasn't been anywhere. She went to cruise in the coast last year. <laughs> And that was a nightmare. She screamed. She'd never been in a car seat longer than 15 minutes. So. Yeah, wow. and, yeah. And I wasn't in the car. I was already down there. And Aaron said when they crossed the county line, leaving Jones County, May started screaming and she screamed for the next hour and 15 minutes. Anyway, so she's not a great traveler yet. Yeah. But we yeah. just went yeah. we just went to Smith Lake with her. She did, and she did awesome. So Ben's ready to like go to Italy now. <laughs> You got her trained. She's ready to go. You know, and I know sometimes the beauty, I guess, of living in Laurel is number one. And I sat next to a doctor in town that, you know, he told me all kinds of great things about y'all and how much everybody in the town looks after you and they love you and they want to protect you. And, you know, I, I guess it's, it's hard sometimes when you, when you live in a small town to realize how global you have gotten until you pick up a copy of People magazine and you're a much bigger picture on there than Prince William, you know, and that blows you away. Or the fact that, you know, that May's name is revealed on This Is Us, <laughs> which that was just cool. wonderful. Yeah. How did that happen? So... Was, Chris Sullivan is just one of Ben's best friends. And yeah, okay. he and I are friends, and um, he's an awesome guy. And yeah. he, we had missed the beginning of that episode, and he texted us. Did you said, see it? He said, "Did you see the Easter egg?" And we were like, huh? "What?" And he said, Have you, "You didn't watch tonight's episode?" And we said, uh, "Yeah, we watched it, but we missed the beginning." He's like, "Go back and watch it. You'll see it." And it. Uh, I think we both cried a little bit about it because May wasn't born yet. Yeah. Yeah. And no um, one in the world would know except him. Yeah. But one day we'll be able to show that to her and yeah, say, she'll think that's so cool. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. I have to admit that really cool. is. All right. So on that note and on yes. the car note. Oh, he's yeah. so excited about this. Are so you ready? This yeah. is so Aaron has a Jeep Grand Wagoneer and Chris's wife, that's her dream car. And I said, well, the show is ending. You should buy the Pearson's Wagoneer. I know the guy that built it. I can get you information about it. And so for the last year, Chris and I have been like going back and forth about this. Man, when they sell that Wagoneer, you better snatch it up. And something about tax laws, they have to sell the vehicles for what they paid for. They cannot sell them for a profit. And huh. they, I, had two of them. they had two of them. And I didn't know that. Yeah, I just knew it was one, and I was like, "How much are they selling the other one for?" And it's so cheap that we bought it. So we have one of the this one of the Pearsons family jeeps. Oh, that's awesome! So, just don't get one of their crock pots. Hello. Yeah, I'm scared that's of crock awesome. pots now. Just to let you know it, that Aaron won't use one now. Yeah, <laughs> I've never used a crock pot. Oh, my <laughs> mom did. She cooked I've everything. Yeah. yeah, my mom would cook anything in a crock pot. I mean, it was like that thing was burning 24 7. You know, it was yeah, cooking was meth, meth, you name it. She was cooking it. Yeah, it who knew? You were so happened. dangerous. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm lucky to be here talking to you today. I really. Uh, but so on that note, real quick, yeah, I think sure. the first time where, I, and I tell this story a lot, where and this was in like season two or three, we were in New York for media walking down like fifth avenue or something you know and it was the holidays and so tons of people and we were like in a sea of people crossing a street and the you know the sign changed and we started walking across you're not paying attention to anybody that's coming across and a guy wearing a new york yankees hat and he had dark rim glasses and he had a lot of tattoos and a beard and he he hit me on the shoulder as he went by and it was enough that it was like you know, I, I turned in this like fight or flight mode, like what, you know, what's your problem? And he said, and then 
Brooklyn accent, which I won't try. He said, hometown, I love your show, man. And then he kept, then he just turned and kept walking. But I want, I wanted so bad to be like, thanks, man. Thank you so much. And, but to be there and experience that, that was, was like, that was big, cow. big moment. Yeah. This is way bigger than And WDA. for me, really, uh, the cover of People Magazine was crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Every time, it's been, how many, three? Four. Four? No, real. Four. I don't know what that. I can't remember how many times it's three or four, but that sounded like a humble brag, but it wasn't. It, it wasn't. Was like, I really can't remember. Yeah. And the thing is, is that I remember when I was little, my mom would buy People magazine when like Princess Diana would be on the cover. And yeah, no, I think it was Prince Louis that was on the cover with you. Yeah, ninety four. Yeah, yeah. mid nineties. Mel Gibson was on the cover, <laughs> and <laughs> and it, that was a very weird and surreal thing that, yeah. that makes People magazine feel like a small thing. All of That's this, the thing about this. It makes that HGTV it, feel like a very small thing because if we're on it, it can't be bigger than WDAM, the local yeah. news section. That's once we're associated with it, it diminishes it, and makes it smaller to us. It's it's yeah. a total out of body experience in in the sense that yeah. like two or three years ago, I had a Barbara Bush cartoon that went really really viral, and Jenna Bush Hager was that she used it on their in her segment about her grandmother, and so when they finished it, oh, I had. I had Savannah and, and her and Hoda all going, that Marshall Ramsey's the sweetest, most wonderful man. And was, I was just sitting there, I was sitting there watching it going, ah, <laughs> it was just bizarre. So I can't even imagine what y'all, y'all just like going, oh, this is, this is, I got to wake up from this, you know? And, and, but I'm like I said, there's so much of a blessing to this, obviously, like I mentioned before, you're able to lift up a lot of boats and you're very open and you're very honest and you're wonderful on social media. I mean, uh, both of you just really share so much of your heart on it. And it, it makes, it makes, it makes me feel like I know you better that way. But uh, as we all know, there is a dark side to this thing. And there are people that sometimes don't mean well. And every once in a while, Aaron, I know you'll clap back. And when somebody comes out like a good mama bear should, that's tough, isn't it? When you when you do get that r- random person that's just a jerk. Imagine if grown folks talk to each other the way they do on social oh, I media. I know. And I think that's the point I'm always trying to make is you would never say that to me in person. Right. So why are you saying it here? It's it's and you you experience it. And is it that we're southern and our mamas taught us how to act in public? Mm, no, it's not because it's it, the 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 one that is the most glaring for me there is someone that goes to church with us mm-hmm. who said something really nasty about us on social media and we saw it and then they started going to church with us they, they married a gentleman that goes to our church and um they started going to church with us and they are very like with us now, they're they're and they they've always been this way. They're very like uh, talk about the show and how much they love it and how much they love us. And it's like well, that's not what you said yeah. there. And I think that that's like these the anonymity of these yeah is really scary and really dangerous. And um, I don't know. We're at our house. These don't exist. Yeah. We, Helen is terrified of phones because we've told her they have a bad place and you can go to the bad place and you don't ever want to do that. So anytime she sees like, I say, Helen, can you pass me my phone? She just like, yeah, doesn't want to touch it. And that's good. Yeah. that's yeah. What we want. I don't think, I don't think anyone is equipped to deal with social media and, and what comes with that until you're at least 21 years old. We Shoot, didn't have it until we were we were 21 yeah. and we didn't know how to handle it then. And we're still, I mean, like still today, like it's. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's not the real world. Right. And no, it's not. Like, yeah. This it's is not the, the real world we're in it's right not the real world. Right. We're on Zoom. That's the real world right there, right? Yeah, this is the real world. <laughs> this is the pandemic world. Um, yeah. But it's, it, it's not the real world, but it is still like you are still saying things about people and about real people. Yeah. And, um, a lot of people have a really hard time of 
differentiating that like the reality ben is that, thinks trolls and critics are hysterical yeah he but thinks then, they're hilarious but then also like i have have you seen the social dilemma yes Woo! yeah oh i know terrifying yeah uh, but i've got you know nieces and nephews and two little girls at my house and um and it's really scary to me like what what these things can do to people. And so I gave up social media for Lent mm-hmm. and it was so wonderful. Um, but Laura, who you've been dealing with is yeah. now, she is, um, I, I send her things. I'm like, Hey, can you post this on, on my Instagram and on my Twitter? And I'll like write everything out for her. And so it's basically like I'm doing it, but I'm, I'm not seeing any of the response from it. Yeah. And the temptation is still there. Like you want to go back. So that's not like, I don't think that there, I don't think that, I don't know when you become fully equipped to handle social media. It's, it's weird. Cause some, some people want to get their dopamine that way. You know, it's like yeah. I said, it's, it's a drug and, and I kind of treat it like, and, and I, I make people mad. I, I know this may shock you with some of the cartoons I do. Um, what? I know go, fi- go figure, but everyone I, agrees in politics. I thought. I know, but yeah, everybody's really together right now. You know, I mean, everybody's just right there singing Kumbaya. Exactly, exactly. But, you know, a lot of these comments here, almost like, you know, a piece of poop floating down the stream. You can reach and grab it and pull it towards you, or you can let it just keep going down the stream. (laughs) That is a beautiful analogy. Thank Adam you. Trask has a good analogy. He told me about the other I would day. like to see him paint that, actually. That would be beautiful. <laughs> he said, um, but you know, these crazy people who are so hateful on social media, they're yeah. really a very, very small majority, oh, like yeah. small majority of people. And if you just think of these people as a little ladybug screaming Aww. at you, yeah. then it's not so bad. Well, Larry David was in Yankee Stadium. They showed his picture up on the screen and everybody cheered. And then on the way home on the subway, somebody yelled, mind my language, you suck. And he worried about that for the rest of the night. You know, sometimes that one comment, Look, yeah. speaking of Adam Tress, which by the way, Adam Tress, oh. um, he is of course the illustrator for this. Congratulations, Miss New York Times bestseller. Hey, uh, hold up his print. I'm going to send it to him. He's going to okay. be very excited. He's going to be so happy to see this. Yeah, he is. Uh, he, he is the coolest guy. And, um, this book and why this touched my heart. We, he had a copy of it before it came out and I gave him a copy. We did a book exchange and, um, and I got to see his new Jeep, which is pretty sweet by the way. I know he got the new Bronco, which is, yeah, the new Bronco, which is great. But the thing I love about this book is we had just sold my parents' house of 50 years and to a new family. And, you know, I mean, all my memories of me doing pull-ups on the beam, the steel beam in the basement and me hitting my head on the fireplace. But I mean, just all those memories. And then a new family moves in to make new memories. And um, it's, God, this book is so great. Congratulations. Thank you so much. See, but there's a million people with that same story. Yeah, what you that's why did. it's such a good book. Yeah, it just, you know, I mean, I'm pretty cynical, but it touched my heart. So thank you on that. And it's done really well. Congra- Once again, yeah. you know, you talk about the pandemic, you know, y'all were able to, you know, you're able to pivot and be able to get other products out there and, and so forth. I'm going to go through some of the questions that we have from our, our members who are watching today. And by the way, thank everybody for watching. Um, yeah. What are your clients looking for now in a home? And is it different than from what our parents and grandparents were seeking? This is from Robert K in Pascagoula, Mississippi. A lot of people want open openness Bigger between kitchens. the kitchen and the living room. They want a big, yeah, you know, like it, it's. I mean, we wanted the same thing. No, we didn't want open concept, but it's that cooking is now a social activity. Yeah, uh, and you know, whereas before, like to this day, you want to keep the heat trapped in a very small space. Well, and the and kitchens it's not were that, little, it's, and they were in the back of the house. It's and, a utilitarian thing, and like my, my like my grandmother's kitchen, it's her kitchen. I have maybe opened her fridge three times in my life because it's her kitchen. Like it's a different, whereas like, you know, Helen goes and climbs inside of Aaron's mom's fridge. And like, it's just a different, we just live differently. We live differently now. So that's, I'd say that's one thing. Um, 
and people want outdoor living. People are really investing more in yeah. back porches and screen porches and people want to be outside. And I think that's a post COVID thing. Yeah. People are realizing how valuable outdoor space really is. We finished our, our back deck right before COVID hit. Um, mm. Oh, thank goodness. And we lived on it. Like we never came inside. Mm -hmm. So we got, um, what are the three most used paint colors that you've used on walls over the past few years? Anything, any design elements that you no longer use because it looks dated? That's Barbara M. from Clinton, Mississippi. Mm. What colors, Ann? Um, Misty Air by Benjamin Moore is my number one favorite right now, but Dover White is my trim color always. My whole house is Dover White, trim and walls in here. And then... Uh, I have so many favorite paints. Every house I use something different. Rock bottom is one that for exteriors that she uses a lot. It's like a black that's green, a black green color. Black, yeah. green, gray, blue. Yeah. The house yeah. that you did for in season six for the California couple, where you kind of created a little bit, the craftsman with a Spanish flair to it. Yeah. I thought that turned out really, really well. And, you know, they, and I used to live in San Diego, so I'm, I, I know what they were facing in way of prices and everything. And they come here and pay $250,000 for a house. They must have been just cackling when they heard that price. It's like, that is fantastic. But that house turned out so beautifully. Um, we did another house that will air around Christmas for a couple from California. We, that's one thing that COVID has done. I, there are a lot of people leaving big cities. Yeah. And, um, but we did a house for a couple and it was a, they're a retired couple. They're older. They're really fun. But they said that they had always, or he said he had always wanted to own a mansion. Mm. And he bought one in a <laughs> But it's, yeah. it's like a 2,500 square foot house. And um, he said like, you know, to buy that in the San Francisco area. Oh yeah, is, you could not. He said right. there's not enough. Money. So anyway, yeah, we we went out there last year. One of the things we do with our boys is we take them on a big trip every year around. We took them to London. We took them this year to Maine and Boston. But we, we wanted them to a know there was a bigger world out there, but also to learn to appreciate what we have here. Like for mm -hmm. instance, it's nice to be able to go out to eat with three kids and not have to pay $200 every time you sit down yeah. and have a meal, you know, that sort of thing. And I was just stunned at how much the houses were in San Francisco. I was just like, Oh, yeah. so yes. Laurel sounds very good. Um, definitely on that. we got a couple more questions I'll throw here. Um, if it happens and how do you handle it when a client makes a decision that you don't think is in the best choice, like picking a house too expensive for them, unattainable products wanted, et cetera. And that's from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, so we've, we've had that, it's never like that the house is a bad choice. It's like things that they want design wise that we, yeah. like, you're going to hate that. And, but we, we, we honor their wishes. We honor their wishes. Yeah. And we, um, which by the way, let me interrupt for two seconds. My wife just walked by and get a big grin on her face. So anyway, you just made her smile. So, uh, so we, like we, we get them to own it on camera. Yeah. Yeah. If someone is just like really adamant about making a terrible choice in their house and that we've got to execute for them, yeah. we just find a way to make sure they explain why. And then we let it go because it is their house. It is not my house. And that's things, I guess the thing that's back to internet trolls. Like people will, will come to us and be like, you know, on social media and be like, I can't believe you did this to this house. And like, it's not our house. These people paid a lot of money for this house and they wanted this. And they told you that on camera that they yeah. wanted it. And that's why we did it. You know, we advised them otherwise. <laughs> the end. Every bucket's got to sit on its own bottom, as my daddy says. I like that. And it is very smart to get them on camera saying it too. That, that, does, <laughs> that cleans things up for down the road. Um, one more question here. Would it be possible for HDTV to fund one home renovation a season for a hometown to renovate a home in a low income area of Laurel? Maybe having a sponsor like people magazine did from Linda D in Laurel. So we are actually doing that. We're doing right. that right now. Yay. Yeah. It's a, a home. The that answer would be yes. Yeah. 
Well, um, it was all, it was crowdsourced. It was crowdsourced. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Aaron and I, uh, several people, local people, national people, gave to it. To, oh, that's to great. Yeah, it's great. Uh, how excited were you when Ole Miss won the uh, na- baseball national championship? We didn't watch it. Oh we no! Were, uh, I'm pretty sure we were watching Aladdin. <laughs> yeah, and I'm almost positive we were watching Aladdin. And, and you're probably watching a lot, and you'll watch it a lot more times. Oh, yeah, I'll absolutely. let you in. Uh, spoiler alert. Um, My daddy is the world's biggest Ole Miss fan, and he watched every minute of the baseball. And they were updating it. So, like, you know, we were. Yeah, you were good. We were yeah. experiencing it. Um, but we didn't actually get to watch it. And it was so weird. I got so many texts from people that were like, dude, I just saw you on TV at the game. I'm like, I'm not there. So, um, apparently there were a lot of guys with beards at the game. Yeah. That's shocking. I, I, yeah. Who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk it? Well, I mean, I feel like, I mean, we're coming up against the time and I want to honor the hour, but, um, what's next for y'all? Because like I said, you've, you've, uh, you know, you're right Ooh. now you're, you've got two little ones. You're kind of pulled back a little bit, trying to catch your breath and, and get more episodes filmed and so forth. But where do you think you'll be in five years? No, you know what? I don't yeah. know. That's beautiful. That's honest. Uh, yeah, I love we, that. We don't make plans anymore. We used to try, and there are things that like we want to do. Yeah, but we have plans for our factory and our company. Yeah. But as far as the two of us and what happens with TV and all of that, what will be will be. We made a million plans, and none of them happened. Ben was supposed to be a lawyer. I was supposed to work for a magazine. I was going to live in Birmingham. Well, first, I was going to be a professional basketball player. Yeah, that was the first thing. Yeah. He was also going to play at Duke in college. So here we oh. are. None of that worked out. And this is a thousand times better than anything we ever planned. It's all a God thing. We are, I don't think it's a secret. We're devout Christians. And we yeah. believe that God has something ordained for our lives that we're not in control of it. And we follow his leading. We used and... to try to control it. And I mean, like, we, we mind the checks. Like we, we see things that we're like, mm, nudges. that's not the right choice. This feels like this is the right choice. And, and then doors just open as you go. And sometimes they close and it's hard and it's unexpected, but there's always something better. Anyway, I, I have no idea. I'm working right now. I'm finishing up uh, another book that's going to come out next year. It's not a children's book, but um, it's very much in the same vein of the themes of the Lantern House, yeah. but for grownups. Yeah. We we both have we both have books that we want to do. We both have um, we had a meeting yesterday where we it was not supposed to be this meeting, but it turned into a brainstorming meeting of you know shows. I mean y'all y'all we got to be endorsers for the Elvis movie. What? So yeah, that is so cool. Because Warner Brothers bought and Discovery. We're all in okay. HBO. We're all one thing now. And, yeah. We're Discovery. And they reached out to us. They were like, hey, um, we would like for you guys to be promoters for the movie. And we were like, absolutely. Yes. And yeah. then they said, and, you know, where are you going, are you going to get Elvis? But it was like, you know, we were already going to watch it and tell people to watch it if it was good. And yeah. it was so good. We got to watch it before. We got to interview Austin Butler, who played Elvis. Is he amazing uh, or what? I mean, oh, no he, way. A hundred percent, yes. Oh, my yes. gosh. Yes. Okay, I I wasn't envious of you two yeah. until now, so just to let you know. This is the king, and uh, he's a religious figure in my family. Yeah, I could imagine. I mean, Graceland is like a spiritual trip. It yes. is. Yeah. It is. Pilgrimage. But- um anyway yeah so we had a brainstorm meeting yesterday and aaron and i really want to do like a interior design special oh, episode you could redo Christmas. yeah you could redo the jungle room or not redo i don't want to change we anything wanna... marshall <laughs> hey you can't you can't i nearly got kicked out of the jungle i nearly got kicked out of graceland editorial cartoonists had a convention there and that's when they had live tour guides so we were walking through there making smart aleck comments, which of course got under the skin. It's like making fun of the Pope and the Vatican. You just don't do it. Yeah. And so we get to the jungle room and they said, it took Elvis 30 minutes to pick out this furniture for this. And I said, it took them that long. And they said, sir, if you're not going to respect the memory of the King, we're going to have to ask you to leave. 
Dang. Yeah. So I was, it was like going through TSA making a joke. You just don't do it, you know? And so um, I was a good boy for the rest of the, the tour. I was very humbled on that. But I am so envious. If you'd have said, you know, oh, yeah, and I'm going to get to fly with Tom Cruise and Top Gun next, I'm just like, okay, that would have been amazing too. So uh, um, I want to really bad. But I know. He can't fit in a plane. Yeah. He has friends who like are yeah, in the I've Air got, Force. I've and got got if you people, want to fly, we can put you in one. We're friends with a guy who was a Top Gun instructor. Like he's yeah. from jones county and um i was reaching out to these guys like hey what are the chances of me getting to go up and because they do that they, they have yeah, like, you can find the blue angels yeah yeah you can fly with them and they were like wait how tall are you and how much do you weigh and i told them six six three hundred pounds give or take and they were like yep. yeah that won't work I'm like, oh. ah, you're just a little bit too big and then someone told me that it would cut my legs off if i had to eject and i was like cool i'm I'm good with that. Okay, that's good. I'll go to the movie and watch Tom Cruise do it. That's much better. Yeah. I loved what you were saying about listening to God's, you know, call. And a lot of people don't have, they get so tuned out, they just can't do it. And and um, Roger Parrott, who's the president of Bellhaven, had a really good book about that. But neither here nor there. But I mean, there is a lot to that, being able to listen and being able to to do that. And I can see that in your life. It's very hard. Like it is. It was, yeah. There are, we get so many offers a day yeah. for things that are like, at face value, it's like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And then you look a little bit deeper and you're like, is that what we want mm, to do? Yeah. Is that what we want to be aligned with? Is that, is that representative? In 15 years, will our daughters look back at this and be proud of it? Um, so that's, it's really hard. I would say it's up there as one of the hardest parts of this. So learning how to say no is a superpower. I'm good at no. It's knowing when to say yes is uh, harder. Yeah, okay. Knowing when to say yes is harder. Yeah. We've got no three. is my default. That's what I'm going with first thing. <laughs> but. It's got to be something very, very special to make us go. Is this the well, right thing? Sort of, Should we and try like, this? like small things, like so. Aaron said, "My, you know, I was going to play basketball at Duke University. Yeah. That didn't happen. Uh, not because I wasn't good enough, because I didn't have the grades. It's all. That was just your grades. <laughs> I just didn't have the grades. Um, but uh, my dad went to Duke. He went to Divinity School there, and we're all huge yeah. fans and. We got to go to um, one of Coach K's is next to last home game. Wow. And yeah. um, Coach K had interviewed Aaron and I like this on his podcast. And uh, at the end, towards the end of the game, the our handler said, you know, do you care anything about going to the press conference? And I was like, absolutely. Let's keep this party going. And so me and my brothers and my dad, we got to go to the press conference. And when Coach K came off the stage, he recognized me and he came over and spoke and I got to introduce him to my dad and to my brothers. It's like major, major moment. So it has, as far as like little things like, Hey, do you want to go to a basketball game? Hey, do you want to go? We get invited to Ole Miss football games all the time and we just don't have the time anymore. But I love being able to, you know, call my father-in-law and say, Hey, I got four box seat tickets for Ole Miss versus Auburn. Do you want to go? And he gets to take his buddies and they get to go. And yeah. so um, we got to go to uh, – we get to do a lot of things, but I think that getting to – for me, getting to include our friends and family and letting other people experience this is the best part about it, things like that. I think you've been able to allow a lot of people to be able to share in your success too. And I think that's been a wonderful part of this whole story. And, you know, speaking of saying yes, I am so grateful that you said yes to today. This has been, this has been a pleasure. I've loved talking with you really have. And I got to tell you, you've really inspired me too. And, and so thank you. And um, are there any final thoughts before we head off into, into zoom land? No, I, we're just thankful to be, these like public faces for Mississippi. It's a big it's responsibility a and a huge yeah. honor. And um, 
you're another one of those. When I think of like those of us who represent our who state, get to represent our state beyond the state lines, I feel really blessed and lucky, especially to share that stage with you, for instance. So, well, thank no, you. thank you. That's very kind. And I got to tell you, the one thing I've learned in the 25 years that I've lived here is that people in Mississippi love it when you succeed on the national stage. And y'all have definitely done that. And that's why everybody loves you so much. But I, I just it's really, hard. what's I that? Describe, I, to the network, I just, they talked about how well our pilot did. Yeah. And I said, what you need to understand is that Mississippi is basically one big small town and yeah. we are all rooting so hard for each other. You know, we, we may talk bad about each other, you know, in the line at the potluck at church, but we really want good things for everybody. Yeah. And so. Well, thank you for all the great things you've been bringing to us. And thank you for today. Gosh, this was so much fun. And I'll let you get back at it and enjoy your vacation. I appreciate you sharing it with us. So thank anyway. You so much for us. Yeah, thanks everybody for listening. Thank you. Y'all have a good fourth. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye-bye.